Welcome to this week's sermon from Heights Worship Center. We believe God has something for you today. We hope this message encourages and inspires you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jalisa Maine again. Thank you for allowing me to be here to just share with you what has been on my heart. And so as before I begin, I would just want to thank Pastor and Pastor Don, of course. And I'm 18 years old. And so for me to be up here to be able to share with you what's been on my heart is such a blessing because of the church that I have grown up with. I was literally born in this church. And so you guys have all seen me grow up. And I'm thankful for this church, my church, that has given me and blessed me with the ability and opportunity to stand before you. And you guys have all seen me grow up, and so I'm thankful for the discipleship and for the ongoing um, ministry that opportunities that are ever available to our children. As young as 13, as young as 8 years old, all the way till now, our church continues to disciple, and it's just so amazing that we give these opportunities because it has honestly made me stronger and given me the ability to stand here in front of you because it's not an easy thing to do and you know all glory to God and so I wanted to talk about and continue on the train of truth that we have been talking about as Pastor Don has introduced to us throughout the couple of weeks and I love stories because I was trained with CEF we always go with stories and we teach through Bible stories. And the story that I will go to is the prodigal son. And you guys have probably all heard of this story. And before we begin, let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word, the truth of it, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are our Savior, God. And so right now, we invite you into this time. We invite you into this story. And so we pray that you would bless it and that you would be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. The parable of the prodigal son is beautiful because not only can a little child can grasp its knowledge, but it is so rich that you can continue to grow and learn from it. And as we go into this parable that Jesus himself tells, let us remind ourselves that the Bible is not, does not come from our Western world that it comes from a Middle Eastern culture and society. And this culture is rich and full of differences far from our own culture. And so as we go through this story, we're gonna remember that, that this story is placed in a time and place very different from the culture that we see today. And so we begin with the younger son. And we're going to go to Luke 11 and 12. Let's read it first. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. As we go through this story, we're going to see a shameless request a shameless rebellion, and then a truthful repentance. First is our shameless request. Right here, we have two sons. And we call this younger son, the one who's asking of this request, the prodigal. And prodigal basically means spendthrift, wasteful, self-indulgent. This is a son who is selfish, only thinks of his own and only wants what's best for himself. And you see, this is what he says. Let's go back to the verse. I want my share of your estate now before you die. And the people that Jesus are talking to, there are some Pharisees in the crowd. And you can imagine that during this story, during this part of the story, the Pharisees gasped. This was unspeakable and un, an unforgivable action. You see, this son 
is basically utterly disrespectful to this father who has built up this land, these people, the cattle, the servants. He has cultivated a rich history for many, many years. And this son is going up to his father, basically spitting in his face and saying, I want you dead because I want what's mine now. Who's a parent in the house? (laughs) Who's a parent? I come from a Filipino culture. Okay, and imagine that would be unacceptable. And I can imagine all you parents in the house, as well as my own, would would be horrified at this thought. For the work that you have done to bring your family. I know my Lolo and Lola came from the Philippines and they built our family from ground up to be here and imagine me going up to them and saying, I don't care about what you did for me. I want what you, I want, I want your money and I'm going to, I'm going to dip. I'm out. And that's basically what this son is doing. And in the culture of the Middle East, this is unheard of. This is horrible. And this is something that you would never do because you see the truth of the matter is that this would be equal to saying, like I said, that, Father, I wish you were dead. And so, this is in a way saying, you are in the way of my plans. You are a barrier to what I want with my life. You make me miserable, and I want nothing to do with you. And you see, this father probably had a substantial amount of money. Later in the story, we hear he has a fat calf. He has many servants, and this is not something that was readily available to all the people during that time. This was a luxury. This father was pretty wealthy, so this son knew. He was, he was, he was wise. He knew his father could fund the rebellion he wanted to pursue. This son knew that the father had enough money for him to live the life that he dreamed of. And so when you're talking about what this father what the son wants. He doesn't ask for an inheritance. He asks for his share because he's tricky. He knows what he wants. Inheritance comes with responsibility. As a son, you would inherit from the father once they died. And this inheritance would come with responsibility. You would take care of the land. You would take care of the servants. You would take care of the people. You would have accountability. You would be building upon what has been built. There is responsibility that comes with inheritance, but no, the son wants his share. He doesn't want responsibility. He doesn't want accountability. He wants money. He wants freedom. He doesn't want to be held down, tied down. And you see, this indicates how miserable he is under his father's accountability and his rule. He wants nothing to do with him. And many of you parents and grandparents here would expect the father to be angry, right? That's the appropriate response. And even in that culture, the pro- appropriate re- response would be a good slap on the face, a good palo. And so that would be appropriate. And you know, no one would get mad at the father. They would say, yes, that is the appropriate response. You deserve to do that. Your son has disrespected you. And so you know what? You expect the father to be angry just a little bit. But let's see in verse 12 again. He says, so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Well, this part is shocking to me. How how easily in a way that he just kind of gave up what he had worked for. And you see, this is the way the world works. The world's truth is that Because anything you want, you can do without consequences. You can live your life. You only live once. And you can do whatever you want because you are your own person. Don't care about the consequences for you, for your family, for anyone else. Do what you want to do. And you see, why would the Father allow that to happen? This is God. 
This is God extending freedom to the sinner. And I always wonder, why would God allow us to choose? In the very beginning, Adam and Eve, why would he even allow us to choose if he knew we would choose to be away from him? If we knew we would choose the other way, why would he even give us the reason? And you see, God wants something deeper than just slaves. He wants something deeper than people mindlessly obeying him. And you see, in the beginning, he allowed the snake into the garden. He knew he was there, but why? Why would he allow the snake if he knew what would happen next? And you see, I love that God gives us a choice. And it's a valuable and powerful choice. He gives us a choice. And how can we have choice without options? If he just put us in the garden and said, you have all the options in the world, but it was just the garden, there was no, there's no other option. And so he let the snake in. He lets the snake in because that's the second option. Do you want God or not? And so God gives us a choice and he knows he does it for a reason because he is willing to go through the agony of rejected love. He is willing to go through the agony of being rejected and pushed away because he wants you and I to have that choice to choose to love and be with him. And you see, this is a beautiful choice that you and I still have. Every single day, we have that beautiful choice because God is willing, just like the Father, to give up the right to feel that love, to feel that connection, to be in that relationship. And He is willing to risk His reputation. You see, the Father in that story would be ridiculed. How could you let this happen to your son? Why are you letting him go? He's risking his reputation, his honor, all to give that freedom. And that's what God extends to all of us. He risks everything for that choice. And knowing that some people won't choose the right choice and knowing that some people will make different choices, he allows that choice. And you see, this son wants nothing to do with the father. And this is the sinner who has no interest in God, doesn't want to answer to God, doesn't want to submit to his authority, and wants to get as far away as possible from him. This is the shame, shameless request. And then it leads to a shameful rebellion. Let's go to verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Just a few days later. He didn't wait long. He got what it was his, and he went. And you see, this isn't something that should be a quick process. You see, when you get your land and everything that you own, you have to sell it. And because he's in such a rush to leave and to get out and to go, he sells cheap. Have you ever, anyone ever sold a house before? It doesn't take a couple of days, not a few days. It doesn't happen like that. It's a long process. But because this son is in a hurry and he's rushing and he wants out, he sells cheap. He finds a buyer probably at a discounted price because they know that when you buy this in that culture, you still, in order to possess it fully, the father would have to die until that buyer would be actually able to take on that property. And so this buy wasn't really an easy buy because you had to wait till, still till the father of the land had died. And so he sells cheap. This is the foolishness of our, of our sin. We sell cheap. When we choose to sin, we sell cheap of God's opportunity. We sell cheap of the opportunity and blessing God has bestowed on our life. We sell cheap on the opportunities. We sell cheap on everything that God has put out in the world to give us. We sell cheap. And that's what sin is. And you know what? The devil tricks us that it's a better option. That it's a better opportunity. But the reality is, the foolishness of the sinner is that we sell cheap our life. 
when we give in to the lies and deceit of the enemy. Not only that, he went on into a distant country. And here again, you would hear the Pharisees guess. <gasps> Anywhere that was a distant country would mean it was Gentile land. This was a Jewish boy, and he's going into Gentile land where they don't believe in God. They don't share the beliefs. They don't share the culture. They don't understand what it means to love God. And he does that for a reason. He wants nothing to do with the Father. You see, it tells us that he wastes it all in wild living. Hence, the prodigal son. He squanders it. He scatters all his money. He basically throws it away. And this is the result of living your own truth. This is when the irreligious and the hypocrites want to run away from God because they have no love for him. They want no relationship. They want nothing to do with him. But you know what? Sin never works out the way we think it will, right? Sin never really works out the way we want it to. And in verse 14, this is what he gets. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. So now he's made some bad decisions. <laughs> he's wasted it away. And the world tells us that, you know what, you can do whatever you want. Don't even worry about the consequences. It's okay. You do what you want to do. But you know what? We know the truth. There are consequences for our actions. If you're speeding on the road, you're going to get a ticket. If you are not paying attention. You might hit someone. If you are do, drinking alcohol, doing drugs, there are consequences for your, for your actions. And so this is the consequence of his action. He has no family. He is alone. He has no money. He is the lowest of the low. And you see the irony here is, is that he gets a job feeding the pigs. And because he is a Jewish boy, this is a little crazy too. You can hear the, the Pharisees gasping again. A Jewish boy feeding pigs. The irony is pigs were unclean and ugly and were looked down upon in that culture. And you see, he has no other option but to sink to this level. And you saw... And at this moment, he's not ready to fully humble himself because he, do, he does what we all do. When we find ourselves in a bad situation and we look around and we see, oh no, I got myself in a big, big problem, we try to fix it ourselves. We try to do it our own way. I'm going to get myself a job, he says. Maybe I'll be able to work and it'll be all fine. I'm going to get myself a job. And it's not really a job because he's really just feeding off the pigs. And so this is the typical sinner. This is you and me. We try to pick ourselves up. We try to do it ourselves. We try to go to therapy. We try to marry someone else. We try to choose new friends. We try to make more money. We try to do it on our own. And this, the lesson here is that this son's rebellion, this son rebellion is a total violation of relationship with the father. And this is what it brings him to. This disdain for relationship with the father and a, getting away from all that the father has given his son, all the responsibility, all the accountability, he wants no part of it, you end up bankrupt spiritually, emotionally, physically. 
you become exhausted trying to fix yourself up because you know what? We can never do what we want to fill ourselves up unless we have God. And so the sinner wakes up at the very bottom. This shameless request becomes a shameless rebellion. But thank God that it turns into a truthful repentance. Thank God that the story does not end here. There's, we don't just stay low. We don't stay all by ourselves alone, destitute in a far distant place with no one to help us along. The story does not end here. But God does something amazing. Let's see verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. I love verse 17. He says, when he finally came to his senses, because sometimes it takes us a little while. It takes us a little while to get there, to understand what we really need, to understand what we had lost, to what we had traded for, what we had sold ourselves cheap for. It takes us a while to understand the gravity of our situation. And you see, we just keep going and going and going down the path until we end up at the very bottom. And this is where he ends up. And finally, he came to his senses. And I love this because here we see the heart of a father. At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. How beautiful that this father is not only a good provider, but he is generous. Because not only does his family have enough food, but the servants have enough food. You see, this father is someone who has more than enough and gives more than enough. And you see, the lie of the enemy clouds your judgment to think that this is not enough. That we need something else. That this God is not enough for us. And that's exactly what what happened in the Garden of Eden. When we were given the choice, was Adam and Eve were given the choice, they saw that maybe God made a mistake. Maybe I'm not enough. Maybe I need to be more. We were already made in his image, and yet they wondered, maybe, just maybe, God is not enough. And you see, the lie of the enemy is that you are lacking and that you, have, that you don't have something that God is holding out on you. And you see, the truth is, in Christ, we lack nothing. Amen? That our joy is from our King. That we have wealth fully and abundantly. And so, although the trials and tribulations may come, we have a firm foundation. And you see, I think that's the problem with our generation, that we can't sell God. We can't sell God being like, oh, if you believe in Jesus, you're going to have everything you wish and desire, and all your dreams are going to come true. You're going to be free from everything. You're going to have, you're going to become rich, and you're going to have so much. And you see, God wants that for you, but you know when, thing, when that doesn't work out, people think, oh, God's not enough. Because he didn't do this for me, God's not enough. Because he didn't heal me, God's not enough. Because he didn't do this or do that for me, he's not enough. And that's when we see people losing faith. Because they don't see God for who he really is. And you see, that was a big thing for me that I had to grasp a new understanding of. That I had to re-understand who God was. Because I had forgotten that if, if things and hardships came, I would question God, why, God, why? Why are you doing this? And it would be hard because bad things happen. And bad things happen, but that doesn't change who God is. That never changed who God is. And I am inspired by people like Brother Chuck, like Sister Malou, 
who, even in their last moments, would praise God and say, God, glory to you. Thank you, Lord. You see, it wasn't easy for them. They weren't in their best moments. But they knew who God was in their life. They didn't dep- make change God, their view of God because the, their situation changed. Their view of God stayed consistent because they knew who their father was. They knew that our father is more than enough. Our father is a provider. He is generous. He gives so freely. Our father, he, they knew that. And so I'm inspired by, the, by our elders who are now with he- in heaven with God because they understood the reality of our God. I love the song, the song Gyre where it says, he gives more than you ask, think, or imagine. According to his power, he's working in us. And it is so, thank you, it is so beautiful because that doesn't, when we sing that, that doesn't mean he's going to give you so much money. I think we correlate that with money because we, we are in America. But... <laughs> More than you ask, think, or imagine. That doesn't mean anything physical, money, wealth. And so God really had to deal with me in this story about who he is. He does not change based on the day and based on our feelings. He is good. He is a provider. He is Jaira. And so God is good. And we were in worship, we're talking about how we want a fresh wind, a pouring out. And I believe the first step of that is rooting ourselves in who God is and not letting the devil lie to us and steal our joy and tell us that God is not enough. Because without knowing who God is in our lives, then we will easily lose faith, lose hope. And so in this story, we see a heart of a father. And I believe even though this is the prodigal son, I believe that even more so of the father, this is a story about the father. This is revealing to us who our father is, God the father is, to us. And let's continue in verse 20. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. We see the father once again. And you see that not only was the father, not only did the father just let him come home, but he was looking for him. Because the son was still a long way off. The only way his father could have known that he was coming back was that he was looking, he was searching, he was waiting for the day that his, that his son would return home. God has been waiting for the day that you would come and you would humble yourself and that you would turn from your sin and that you would say, God, I'm sorry. I know what I have done. I have sinned against you. You see, God is not some angry person in heaven with a lightning bolt waiting for the chance to strike you down because you have sinned. He is searching and longing for your return home. And he wants you. He's searching. And he desires you so much that he does not go a day without looking out the window and saying, when will my son come home? When will they return? And so let's not believe the lie that our God is angry at us. I feel like in our culture, if we ju- whenever we make a mistake, we deem ourselves unworthy because, and because of that, it, sh- it misconstrues our idea of who God is. It tells us God is angry. Just because you're angry at yourself does not mean God is angry with you. Just because your parents are mad at you does not make God angry with you. And you see, let's not accept 
Well, let's not misunderstand God because if you've ever been misunderstood, it's the worst feeling to be misunderstood, to be judged for something that you never meant. You see, God never meant for you to believe that he's angry with you, that he's mad at you and that he's condemning you and that he's shaming you. He is longing for your return. And this father ran. Before he even was able to step foot, he ran, filled with love and compassion. He embraced him and kissed him. And you see, this is the truthful repentance. His son recognizes, it says, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. And I believe we need to remember this humility and this heart posture that we should have towards our Father. God doesn't owe you anything. You don't need to demand anything from God. In fact, he gave everything already. And you see, we must come with humility Because let's remember the very beginning of this story, this shameless rebellion, this shameless request that this son would wish his own father was dead, that he ridiculed and mocked and wanted nothing to do with this family. And yet he comes back humbly. And you see, it would be even customary during that time if this were to happen, that they would hold a funeral for the son. Because in their eyes now, this son is dead. This disrespect that he has done to this family to dishonor their name, the son is dead. And the only way he would be welcomed back to this home, to this family again, would be if he could some way repay or rebuy what he had sold. Repay. He would have to work really hard. He would have to do something of great substance in order to earn his way back. That was the custom and culture of that day. It wouldn't be easy. You're not just going to get a free pass and get back in. And that was what custom But you know what? This is the heart of God. Despite the severity of this sin, you see, this was the worst, the lowest of the low. In verse 22, But his father said to the servant, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost but now is found. So the party began. See, when it says this son of mine was dead, it literally meant that he was dead to the family. They had no, they had no part to be part of the family. But you know what? This father holds nothing against what the son has done. He doesn't even bring it up. For me, I'm a little petty. I would be like, you're back? Why are you back? I would make him maybe a little grovel a little at least, beg on your knees a little bit. You know, I would be a little petty. I'd be like, you went and you wasted all my money and now you're back in what? You think I'm just going to let you in? But you see, God's not like us. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, because uh, I'm thankful that God is not like us. He comes and says, quick. He doesn't take a second to think. He says, bring everything. Bring the fat and calf. Get the finest clothes so we can celebrate. And this celebration is so beautiful because that is our God and that is who we serve. He is a loving and compassionate, full of grace and mercy God who calls us by name and accepts us with open arms. He does not hold anything against us and he loves us just as we are. And so the son comes back and... You know, I love that the son came back dirty and you know, the son didn't even have time to clean himself up. He just came to the father. But when he came to the father, the father just picked him up and cleaned him up for him. 
He took him up in the dirty rags and probably the smell of pigs. He picked him up and he got him just as he was and he wrapped him in his own clothing. He wrapped him in his own grace. He didn't call him dirty, but he called him worthy and loved and he called him by name. This son was no longer dead. And thank God that that is his view for you and me. You and I are no longer dead. We have come alive because of his grace and mercy. And so you see, this is a story not about a prodigal son, but a loving father. And the prodigal son is just to show how good God is, how, we, how undeserving we are, and how full of mercy God is. And let us remind ourselves that this is who God is. That this is God in his full glory. And we cannot misunderstand him any longer. We should not think that God is someone that he is not. And you see, this is who God is. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And... If you think that you have been misunderstanding God for a little bit and you felt heavy and you feel heavy saying, God, I don't know. I didn't know that you really loved me, but now, Lord, I want to understand you. I want to fully embrace who you are because God is waiting for you. And you see... If you would like to just repent of that, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you, for not giving you what you deserve, God. And so if this is you, I'd like everyone to stand to their feet at this, at this time. And I'd like you to raise your hands with me just to give God glory. Lord, we thank you for this story of the prodigal son that is really about who you are. We thank you, Lord, that even in the worst sin that we can possibly imagine, in the worst situation we could, we could possibly be in, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for being able to accept us. And Lord, I'm sorry for misunderstanding you. Lord, I'm sorry for thinking that you are mad at me, thinking that you're shameful, think, thinking that you're condemning me. I'm sorry for making you someone that you are not. And so, Lord, right now, thank you for revealing to us, Lord, your goodness. Thank you for revealing to us your kindness, your mercy. And I thank you for the joy that you bring, Lord, in your presence, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that there is no condemnation in your presence, that there is no shame, God, that you are full of love and mercy, Lord, and that no one is too far gone for you, God. I thank you, Lord, that that is who you are and that you have never changed. We thank you that you are consistent that you always are, and Lord, that you were the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for who you are, who you really are, not what the world tells us you are, who the world tells you are, us you are, for who you really are. Lord, we stand on your goodness. We stand on who you are today, Lord, because without you, we are nothing. We don't deserve it, Lord, but you fully accepted us in, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for listening to our podcast. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Visit us in person or online at hwcim.org.